of tunis and then they said well you need a visa so they took me in for our lecture beginning <coughs> begin food week there's been a growing interest of awareness in the food situation in some places out of necessity because of the crucial situation of food in other places due to growing awareness as for the people of Islam. Well, or late last year, as you might all remember, the UN World Food Conference was in Rome. This was basically a meeting of politicians who came together to discuss the World Food Situation. In June of 76, there was a World Food Conference in Iowa State, where hopefully the scientists were are going to get together and discuss their role in feeding humanity. And what we hope to do tonight is get you a view of some in between, more, you know, some of us not a politician, neither a scientist. As we all know, politicians are too general, while scientists can be specific. <laughs> We're going to combine some of the both here today. Uh, I'd like to come back on about Steve Raymer. Steve graduated from the University of Wisconsin. He's worked in National Geographic for the last three and a half years and is an outstanding photographer. Uh, his picture of the Menominee Indians, which he covered in Wisconsin, uh, under the watch in the National Press Club, now the White House, the photographer for watch, that's right. And uh, a few months ago, more like eight or nine months ago, his editor asked to just go and take pictures of the world food crisis. And so this led him to visit about 16 shoot about more, more than 600 roles of film. He also got shot once in Cambodia, was arrested twice, and of all things, was also taken to be a CIA agent at one time. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's kind of a background. Uh, well, before I really <coughs> turn the floor over to him, to him, I'd just like to emphasize that this week is Food Week at Iowa State, and I think some cards have been passed out to you to fill out, and you can leave them at the end when you leave. Also, the brochures as to what's going on on campus this week and they draw behind at the end of the room. And uh, I guess that's it then. Without further ado, Thank you, Brian. Is the mic working? Okay, fine. You've just stolen all my good punchlines, <laughs> being arrested and so forth. Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, just a little bit about the food crisis around the world as kind of I saw it in this past year. And then I assume that you've all come here to look at some photographs. So I'd like to show you tonight maybe about 100, oh no, we need the lights on for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to show you maybe about 100 of the photographs that we considered for an article that will be in the July issue of the National Geographic called Can the World Feed Its People? Uh, it's really, I, I'm impressed that we can get so many people out here tonight for a, a talk about the food crisis. When I came back from this assignment, and I guess it did take about nine months, and uh, 100,000 miles, mostly by airplane, uh, it seems, and uh, 653 rolls of film. When I got done with this, I thought, well, I photographed agriculture, particularly plowing and cultivating the land about every conceivable way. And I thought, well, I maybe have only a couple of options to me for my next act. And one might be to go to work for the Boeing company as a consultant on their, their 747, since I had to take so many. And the other might be to teach agriculture out here at the University of Wisconsin. It's really nice, in fact, to come and you know, show my photographs and talk about this subject, which I guess is rather serious. Um, oh, let's see here. Maybe if I could start this little talk about uh, you know, an experience that I had, uh, we might kind of get ourselves in the mood for this. Uh, the food crisis story was certainly one of, of really incre incredible contrasts. And I would just like to tell you for a second about a, a rainy Thursday uh, last November in, in the capital city of Bangladesh, the, uh, Dhaka. And Bangladesh is the, the poorest country in the world with a per capita income of about $67 a year. And I'd been in Bangladesh about uh, two weeks by then. This was mid-November. And the uh, Intercontinental Hotel in Dhaka, kind of such as it is, was uh, a little bit like the Continental Palace Hotel in Saigon in the heyday, uh, I guess, over there. The Foreign Press Corps had just jammed the place to come and, and cover what was uh, reported to be the worst famine anywhere in the world since the famine in West Bengal. And uh, 1943. And I guess after a couple of weeks uh, there, I was one of the more senior journalists, and I ran into a Danish correspondent who uh, had just arrived in Dhaka, and he wanted to kind of get into this uh, and get right into it and, and you know, see what the, some of the destitute camps looked like where the refugees were trucked after they arrived in the capital city from the, the really famine kind of stricken areas in the north. And it was a, a 
it was raining, as I mentioned, and we got a pedicab and went out and visited several camps. And on the way back, it was getting close to sunset. I suggested that we look at a, a Red Cross feeding kitchen only about three blocks from the Intercontinental Hotel, where, by the way, there was plenty of food. In fact, um, Tiger beer from Singapore cost you $5 a can there, but at least there was uh, food to be had. And I had seen this, anyway, to continue the story, I'd seen this Red Cross feeding kitchen over the past week, and it looked to me that every day, that, like there, every day there were more and more people, and that one of these days there were going to be too many people, as if there weren't already, for the amount of food that they had to give away, which were only a few chapatis, kind of unleavened pancakes. And so uh, we went and took a look at this place, and we saw the women making the chapatis, and uh, people queued up for food, and the food distribution started. Well, this was the day that uh, there were too many people. In fact, there were a couple of thousand too many. And what, what happened was that there was a food riot, a, a terrible thing. Uh, I had my shirt ripped off in the middle of it trying to photograph it. Uh, several little children were trampled to death, and, and uh, more than a thousand people really went hungry that day. And the looks of desperation on the faces of the people, I guess, is, is probably something that I, I, I won't forget for a long time, I know. And uh, we went back to the hotel and, and we're talking about this. And, and I remember that I had a, an engagement. Uh, I'd been invited for dinner with an American couple. And I, I got to their house, uh, some people who ran the um, Save the Children Federation office, a nice, nice young couple from, of all places, Ames, Iowa. And uh, I got there, and a the number of other American young people had assembled. And pretty soon, the, uh, the girls brought in uh, several turkeys, dressing, pumpkin pie, couple of bottles of Almaden wine, and uh, everybody sat down to Thanksgiving dinner because that was Thanksgiving Day uh, back here in the States. And uh, I guess the whole story was, was one of these sort of uh, memorable contrasts like this. And I, I guess I tell you that story for a couple of reasons. One is that in Bangladesh, you know, you really see the makings for the, for the food crisis with a, a ex just an incredible population growth. In Bangladesh, there are seven births a minute. You can sit here and watch the sweet panning your watch in Bangladesh, seven people on the average have been born in that minute. And yet, after population increase, it seemed to, to myself and, and my colleague, who was the author of this article, as we traveled around the world, that, uh, and interviewed and, and talked with scientists and economists and, and a wide variety of people concerned with the subject, that after population increase, the next thing, uh, the next biggest factor that's going to do us all in, not just the most vulnerable countries, but maybe all of us, is this incredible affluence we see here in North America and other parts of the world. And I'm sure it's no secret to most of you who are interested in this subject that here in North America, we consume five times the amount of food resources that the average person in India or Niger or Mexico does. Uh, we consume about a ton of grain a year on the average, where a person in India might consume about 400 pounds. Of course, we cycle most of our grain through animals, uh, which is you know, not the most efficient way to do it. And uh, there's a good question, I think, to be raised as to you know, how long this can, can keep up. Why don't I talk just for a second. Uh, I see some familiar faces from the journalism classes here. And this might be a little bit boring to you. But why don't I talk just for a, a second about how we did this article. Uh, I mentioned the, the 100,000 miles and the 653 rolls of film. And, and I don't think these statistics really mean much in, unless we talk about uh, how you come to grips with, an art, with an, a subject as, as large as the food crisis. Well, uh, last uh, spring, I guess it was last June, I came back from, from Iowa, again, of all places. I've been working on an article about the Amana colonies. And I uh, was floating around the office trying to stay out of sight and uh, catch up on my sleep and whatever. And I got a memo in my mailbox from my boss, the director of photography. His name is Bob Gilka, and he's known as a person of uh, a few words. And uh, I guess it was... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm only too aware of that. And there's a memo in my mailbox that said, Steve Raymer, RE, or regarding your assignment status. It said, please do the necessary photography on the world food crisis. Thank you. <laughs> Bob Gilka. <laughs> and that was the 1st of June. And the 1st of uh, February, my photo editor and I put out 150 transparencies on the light table and showed them to the uh, assorted geniuses at the National Geographic who more or less have to pass on your work and say, yes, you've done the job, or no, you haven't, and you have to go back somewhere. And in the intervening eight or nine months, uh, my, bo my boss never asked me where I was going or how much money I was spending. Uh, 
uh, nor necessarily uh, what I knew about the subject. It was one of these things where you pick up the ball and run with it, uh, hopefully, and uh, you know, really get into it and go out and do it. And a uh, terrific amount of autonomy and freedom, but by the same token, uh, you know, uh, I was kind of left uh, rather staggered with this memo and thought, well, what do I do now? Uh, in the intervening couple of weeks, my picture editor and I uh, went to a, a number of universities. I'm sorry to say we weren't able to make it out here to, to Ames, but we went out and talked to just about everyone uh, we could think of and, and whose name we, we got who knew something about the food crisis. We also read, uh, of course, uh, many of the books that I'm sure uh, all of you are familiar with if you studied this subject. Uh, one problem last June was that no one was quite sure if there wa really was a food crisis, uh, and if there was, what were the dimensions of it. And we found that as we went to the number of universities that uh, academic people, such as yourselves, were grappling uh, for the same scraps and shreds of information that we were. And uh, we, were all kind of, we all kind of began in the dark. But after a couple of weeks, at least, we narrowed it down to kind of the outer limits of what this story was all about. And if I can just mention a couple of these, I've, I've already mentioned population and population incre increase. We have uh, just about 4 billion people here you know, on the Earth today. There's a good question, be, you know, there's a question being raised by a great many people as to just how many more we can support. Uh, affluence, I mentioned that. Uh, and, we're, you know, and, and as we narrow down these things, we want also wanted to find areas or, of the world or countries that more or less typify these, <coughs> these ideas that we had to, we had to illustrate. Uh, so I mentioned affluence. Well, there's no better place to see this incredible affluence, I don't think, than maybe here in the United States, but someplace overseas uh, is Japan. Japan is a country that uh, is newly rich, and not only is it uh, you know, fairly recently rich, but it not only ha has its diet changed as a result of this, but many of its cultural values as well. If you go to Japan, what do you see all around Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, whatever? McDonald's. The Japanese have an incredible appetite for beef and dairy products and beef by byproducts. And to the uh, average uh, Japanese family, there's nothing better than to spend a Sunday going shopping and uh, wash everything down with a Big Mac and a uh, vanilla shake. Uh, this is a country that really hadn't tasted uh, a beefsteak to any appreciable degree until after World War II. Okay, I uh, wanted to talk about the politics of food and, and food aid. I'm sure it comes to not much of a surprise to most of you that last year, uh, well over half of all of our food aid here in the United States went to two countries, Vietnam and Cambodia. And uh, one country, there's uh, certainly a famine, Cambodia. Uh, another, uh, there are a lot of uh, questions as you know, just how critical the food shortage was in Vietnam. But nevertheless, uh, for many of us who were laboring under the idea that this was a great humanitarian country that put its humanitarian needs first or objectives first and its political considerations second, there was a, you know, there were a lot of eyes to be opened here, uh, beginning with the author and the photographer. Uh, let me skip back to my notes here. Look at some of our other. Uh, I wanted to do something with the research uh, that's going into increasing. Uh, food uh, production around the world, as well as into the exotic foods. Uh, went to Mexico, uh, me outside Mexico City, to see Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate, another uh, native Iowan, uh, and his, uh, oops, is that for real? There we go. Well, we went to see Norman Borlaug, the winner of the 1970 Nobel Peace Prize for his work in uh, developing the high yielding strains of, of wheat and uh, photograph the r research there, and uh, research in other parts of the world. Oh, OK. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, would be an obvious thing, I think, to go to Bangladesh or to India to deal with the, the famine. Uh, uh, something that's far more insidious and involves a great many people is malnutrition. In fact, I don't know how many of you have read the book by Bread Alone by Lester Brown, but he estimates that there's as many as 1.5 billion people in the world that are, who are affected by some forms of malnutrition. And malnutrition is really the sort of life-sapping uh, thing that you see around the world that's, that's really the, the byproduct of the food crisis. Uh, sure, sure there, there, there are going to be things like, like Bangladesh, where kind of all four horsemen came together and uh, you know, an incredible uh, set of circumstances produced a famine. That, that'll be there, these, these cases of, of an acute food shortage. But something that's, that's far more prevalent and, uh, and you know, as I said, insidious is, is malnutrition. Again, uh, in Mexico, I, I found a, a researcher, a doctor who'd been recommended to me, who was doing some, some fascinating work, and it also made some good photographs. So I think you, you see what we're trying to do here is to come up with some ideas, the, the main, main ideas that we wanted to cover in our article, and then uh, somehow finding a way to translate these ideas onto film. 
Uh, it's one thing, for instance, to sit um, in your hotel room or at your office and, and write about India's uh, family planning program or, or lack of it. It's another thing to go to India and, and really try to, to picture this, to visualize it, to somehow uh, get on that, that little 35 millimeter transparency, something that says uh, family planning and uh, population control. Uh, in India, you'll see uh, in my slideshow here a, um, a little, little essay on a nurse midwife uh, in uh, northeast India in the state of Bihar. About the only thing that's happening, in fact, in India, uh, if you're interested in the area of family planning and population control, is a program funded by UNICEF where uh, women uh, nurses on a regular basis bring some sort of modern medical care to the villages, uh, try and wear, uh, they wear two hats. One of, one of their roles is to try to reduce infant mortality, and, uh, and this is in a country where, I guess, what, half of all the children die before they're age, the age of 15. Uh, and the other hat is to uh, introduce women to a variety of, of uh, birth control and contraceptive devices. Okay, this is the kind of the way we did it. Now, uh, after that, you, you might be interested uh, in just, you know, maybe one or two problems, and uh, then we'll kind of look at the slideshow, okay? I think, uh, having been a newspaper and wire service photographer, I worked for the Milwaukee Journal and for the Associated Press. Um, the fun part was to actually, and, and something I really felt like I knew what I was doing, was to go out and actually make these pictures once we knew uh, where we were supposed to go. That, that's really fun, and I'm, I guess, lucky enough to get paid for kind of my hobby. Uh, getting, getting there, however, is another story. Uh, Brian mentioned going to, being arrested as a CIA agent. Uh, I think the, the biggest hassle, uh, without a doubt, in doing this article was uh, uh, just the idea of, of being an American journalist overseas these days when the United States is not very well liked. In fact, uh, my colleagues and I uh, often wish that we could get Henry Kissinger isolated in a room for about a half an hour and talk to him about what it's really like to be an American uh, uh, overseas in, in many parts of the world today. And I, I guess maybe the best example of that, again, is India. I arrived in New Delhi at the airport at uh, 8, 9 o'clock at night, Saturday night. And we uh, photojournalists, uh, whether we work for National Geographic or other places, we all seem to travel with these metal uh, sort of suitcases. They're made by a Halliburton company in, in Dallas. You've seen them, right? And uh, I was in the baggage claim area, and you can think of the O'Hare Airport or Des Moines Airport. You're clearing your bags. It's a kind of an innocuous sort of thing. And I'm, I had 10 of them, but I'm you know, getting them lined up here. And pretty soon, there are five policemen literally swooped down on me. Uh, pardon me, Professor Schwartz, for using such a cliched term. Uh, uh, but they did swoop down on me. And, uh, it wasn't a pre-dawn raid, but it was, they did swoop down, and they swooped <laughs> down. And uh, along with an Indian customs officer, and I said, well, God, what's going on? They said, aha, an American CIA agent. And I said, no, 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 I'm an American journalist. Come on. And I pulled out my uh, National Geographic photographer's card, and they said, aha, national. Oh, geez, CIA agent, we got you pointed. <laughs> and, you know, this one Indian customs officer was going just bananas. He said, how could you be so blatant, you Americans, trying to penetrate our country just so openly? And I said, no, 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 no. Well, I saw my baggage go one way, and I went another way to the detention hall. Uh, this was after having a visa and everything, and I got my one phone call. Well, I called the U.S. Embassy, and I got a Marine guard on the phone, a U.S. Marine guard. His name was Sergeant Martinez. And the first thing I said is, Sergeant Martinez, don't hang up. <laughs> and uh, I explained my plight to him, and uh, waited about an hour, and uh, gee, an angel <laughs> came. Got the press attaché from the U.S. Embassy arrived. And he's negotiating with these people, trying to convince them that I'm not a CIA agent, really to no avail. Ex so they keep my equipment, and he negotiates kind of a partial truce here. I can come into India, and I already have spent, you know, untold hours trying to get a visa to come into India. I can come into India, my equipment stays there. So for the next week, uh, this poor man, I shouldn't say poor, but uh, this man from the embassy, the press attaché, spent the entire week trying to negotiate the release of my equipment. Finally, it took a letter from Ambassador Moynihan personally guaranteeing that uh, you know, I would stay out of trouble and he'd be responsible for me and I was a reputable journalist and one thing or another uh, to get my equipment uh, back. So we thought. We go back to the airport, we talk to the customs officer again. He says, well, this all looks very official, of course, but you understand I don't have any authority to release your equipment. Uh, and at that point, I, and he, I uh, reached into my wallet and I pulled out uh, three $50 bills. And I said, but maybe we could talk about posting a personal bond for this equipment. And when I said personal bond, he knew and I knew we were talking about a bribe. The $150 <laughs> got the equipment and we were off on our way, uh, we thought. <laughs> it turns out, of course, that the Indian government um, 
is, is quite sensitive to American journalists or journalists from other parts of the world coming to, to portray the, the, the uh, very immense problems that that country faces. And, and that was really the only, only the beginning. But it, it maybe gives you some idea uh, of the, uh, <laughs> the problems involved. I really mean it. Taking the pictures oftentimes is the fun part. Um, in a minute, we'll, we'll take a look at the slides. And I'm going to be showing you, by and large, uh, my successes. I think in all fairness uh, to uh, everyone who's concerned with the food crisis, I should talk just for a second about uh, my failures on this assignment. And uh, Africa in the sub-Sahara region known as the Sahel, where the drought's been going on for six years, uh, this was really uh, where I fell down. Uh, there are six countries involved in the drought. Uh, Af or Mauritania, Mali, Chad, Upper Volga, Niger, Senegal. Does that make six, I think? Yeah, OK. Well, uh, how do you decide which of the six to go to uh, if you're going to portray what's happening to the drought? And by the way, one thing I didn't mention is we wanted to talk about long-term climatic change. Uh, a great many people are suggesting that what you see in sub-Saharan Africa is not the result of overgrazing or uh, overcultivation, but it really is the beginning of some, some very long-term uh, climatic changes. So obviously, Africa was a, in the drought region was a, an area of the world that I, I wanted to go see and, and photograph. Well. Uh, all six of these countries maintain embassies in Washington, so beginning with the embassies to apply for visas sounds like a logical place to start. Well, uh, four of them would close, close their doors in my, my face uh, right off the bat. Two of them wanted your visa filled out in Arabic and show their solidarity with the Arab brothers. Uh, I, uh, my Arabic isn't very good. I don't know how yours is, but uh, I, you know, there, so two right off the bat uh, you know, were kind of scratched. Uh, two more said, uh, absolutely not. No way do we want an American journalist snooping around Mali. Uh, was one of them, and Upper Volga was another. Uh, Senegal, then, is not so badly affected by the drought. Uh, that was really the port city where many of the relief supplies came in. So it boiled down to the one poor, tiny, uh, not really tiny, but certainly very poor uh, country of Niger, or Niger, however you'd like to pronounce it. So get a visa from the uh, embassy, off to Paris, then uh, on to the capital city of Niamey, uh, Niger. Fortunately, we had cabled ahead to the US embassy thinking there might be some problem as you come to this country. And uh, we were greeted at 3.30 in the morning by the charge aid affairs at the US Embassy. And anytime you see a high American official at the airport at 3.30 in the morning, you probably can figure there's trouble. Um, he uh, greeted us at the immigration area and said, uh, there's trouble. And I said, well, what's the trouble? And he says, well, there's an ABC film crew at your hotel. And they've been here all week, but their cameras are still here in the customs house. And uh, I thought, oh my god, this is India all over again, right? And he said, well, we're going to try something different. I brought my boys. His boys were six, guard, six Marine guards at the US Embassy, <laughs> all, all in civilian clothes. And he said, we'll try to get your equipment in for you. And I said, OK. I said, what do you want me to do? Go out and stand in the parking lot. OK, so these guys go in the baggage claim area, get all my Halliburton cases, put them up there. And then the nice man from the US Embassy pulls out his black diplomatic passport and says, this is official US government luggage. You can't touch it. And at 3.30 in the morning, why we got it through. Uh, this was only the beginning, however. It turns out that Niger is a military government. Uh, the first thing you find out is that you need a, a permit to carry a camera on the, as you walk around the capital street of Niamey. Well, how do you get a permit? You go to the Ministry of Information. Aha, you're a foreigner. You go to the Foreign Ministry. The Foreign Ministry says, no, no, no. You go to the Interior Ministry, since they're responsible for the police and so forth. The Interior Ministry, of course, refers you back to the Foreign Ministry, and it's a catch-22. Uh, the other thing is that all the, the starving people in Niger uh, and the real problems were about 450, 500 miles from the capital city of Niamey. And there's a law there with a good military government that's in power that says foreign journalists aren't allowed outside of the capital city of Niamey. Well, it's a long trip from Washington to find that out. So I met a guy from the New York Times. And by the way, your fellow American correspondents are about as helpful as anybody in a, an assignment like this, I've found. And this guy from the Times uh, and I decided, well, we're going to pretend we didn't hear that. So uh, we got an airplane flight to a place called Agadez, which is at the edge of the Sahara Desert. And in a place called Agadez, you're not going to believe this, but Mr. Avis and Mr. Hertz are busily uh, at work <laughs> renting Land Rovers. <laughs> so we uh, saundered, saundered up to the Avis rent-a-car stand. <laughs> the hotel is made out of mud, but Avis is there, right? <laughs> And for only 141 US dollars a day, <laughs> you, can, you, you can have a Land Rover, any of us. 
That included gasoline and unlimited kilometers. Well, we had the car. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, starving people were still 125 miles away in a place called Ingal. Well, uh, we met some, some Dutch nurses and doctors who worked for an outfit called Church World Services. And uh, they knew the camps and they knew a little of the language spoken by the Tuareg people, the nomadic people who were severely affected by the drought. And we persuaded them to come along as our, our native guides. My wife had made me uh, about 10 pounds of granola, which I offered as a peace offering to these kids. You know, I'll, I'll give you my granola, and you come along and help us find these, these people in these refugee camps. And it, we, we struck a bargain, and we were all off. We thought for a, you know, an, a look at uh, what was really happening. Well, we got out there, and we got arrested just about uh, 10 minutes after we started work. American food was certainly on hand in this place called Ingal, but the American food was being used to feed the army. It's a military government, right? All the American food that was coming out of the big AID warehouse being trucked right off to the local uh, army compound. The rest of it was being sold on the black market, and the uh, nomadic people were, were, they were in the camps all right, but they had very little, if anything, to eat. Uh, the army arrested us, uh, put us in detention, and uh, we're explaining that we're representatives of the American people. We're here to show the taxpayers of the United States what's happening to their money and treasury and so forth. Uh, it didn't work. We were shipped uh, under arrest back to the capital city in Miami. The whole process reversed itself and uh, expelled from the country. I have about four photographs of Africa that I made before we got arrested, and you'll see all four of them. So <laughs> long. <laughs> So a long way to go for such a few pictures. And the, as it turns out, the embassy was kind enough to send my film out of the, in the diplomatic pouch only uh, hours before the uh, military showed up at our hotel to confiscate my film. We uh, gave him some blank film. And my friend Henry Kahn from the New York Times was beautiful as he talked about John Peter Zinger and uh, the whole history of freedom in the press in the United States. <laughs> uh, well, this is kind of a serious subject, and, and we really have kind of been enjoying ourselves, I guess, here, and that's good. Um, let's look at some photographs. We start with the famine in Bangladesh, and our articles really, uh, can we have a lights for <laughs> one more second? <laughs> we, start, we start with the famine in Bangladesh. Um, I mentioned Bangladesh is, a, uh, is, the most, is the poorest country in the world. It was struck by uh, a famine last October. And in about six weeks, 100,000 people died. It's about twice as many people as we lost in Vietnam in five years, in about five or six weeks. Uh, for the most part, I don't think these people had to die. It was a real man-made famine. Uh, Bangladesh really has almost the capacity to feed itself. Uh, it's a, it's, believe it or not, there are 80 million people there, and it's a state identical to the si in size to Iowa, 55,000 square miles. Now, I think Iowa's got about 3 million people, hasn't it? OK, well, Bangladesh has 80 million, same size, about 1,300 people per square mile, 2,200 people per square arable mile, since Bangladesh is really a, a big delta. Uh, uh, what you see there is a terrific amount of inflation. Rice was 60 cents a pound when I got there. That's 60 American cents in a country with a per capita income of $67 a year. And there's food there. I, I, I mean, I really mean this. I didn't go hungry, nor did any of the other American and Canadian young people that I spent three weeks with. Um, we could afford $5 a can for beer if you were thirsty or, or 60 cents a pound for rice. But uh, the vast majority of the people you know, were, were really priced out of the market. Uh, about half of the rice crop is smuggled into India where the farmer receives twice the price for his crop. Now, if there's one thing I found in going to 16 or 17 countries on this story is that there no, there's no such thing as a stupid farmer. Uh, I, I never met a stupid farmer. There, they're uh, going to sell their crop where, in, in where they can get the most money. So about half of all the crops are smuggled into India. Terrific amount of hoarding and black marketeering, a terrible system of food distribution, uh, uh, extremely corrupt government in the refugee camps. I saw it happen time and time again, where officials would demand bribes before they'd issue uh, ration cards to the hungry people. Uh, and as we, we've talked about, uh, overpopulation uh, kind of to the point where I think Thomas Malthus may be proved correct. Uh, and a relief effort being marshaled by the United States and a number of other Western countries and a great many East European countries, too, surprisingly. And yet, by the time we really got this thing organized, the relief effort to help these people, there was very little food, I mean grain, to be bought on the International Grain Exchange last year. I saw U.S. Air Force 
C-130s coming in from Utapau Air Base in Thailand, along with bringing the turkeys for Thanksgiving dinner for the Americans. They were bringing in survival biscuits that had been taken from fallout shelters in California because the United States government couldn't find any grain on the World Grain Exchange to buy and ship to Bangladesh. Um, we really don't have much of a food policy in this country, uh, as you probably know. And uh, by that time, there was precious little to, uh, to ship over there. So all this kind of combined uh, to make a, a pretty, uh, pretty horrifying situation. We'll start there. And I have a little, I, I, at times, I've worked up slideshows with a multimedia thing with music and everything. Well, I, I think this is a pretty serious subject. And I, uh, so I didn't do that. I think maybe if I just talk about some of these pictures as we go along, um, you know, we'll get more out of them. And then let's have some, some questions afterwards. And, and if you're interested in photography, fine. Uh, if you're interested in the food crisis, good. You know, we can talk about both. So let me find my um, cord here. The mic's still on? Yeah. OK. Uh, OK, the lights. Finally. <laughs> These are people riding the railroad train from the, uh, to the capital city of Dhaka in the far north in Bangladesh. Sir, maybe, maybe somebody could move their head there uh, down in the lower right. There we go. When I first saw this train, I thought maybe this was, was cotton or something on the top of the railroad cards, but those are all people. Fleeing the, the north, riding two, three hundred miles to the capital city of Dhaka. And this is something you could see almost every day in Bangladesh. And you get to the railroad station, and this is what you see, children suffering from very advanced malnutrition. At the railroad station, I talked to a man from the district in, uh, of Rangpur, and I asked him, well, how did you arrive here? How did you get here? And he said, well, uh, when the rains came last fall, I um, was out of work. The crops were inundated. And I sold my bullocks to buy some money for my family for food. And then I sold my farm implements. And then he sold his pots and pans and his wife's jewelry, her rings, and so forth. And finally, he said uh, several days before coming to the railroad station, he sold the tin roof off their house. And after he'd sold the tin roof, over their house, he realized they had no place to live and no place to go, so they rode the train to Dhaka. As these people came off the train, a woman uh, walked off the train and walked down the platform, took about 15 steps and laid down and gave birth to this baby. This baby's about five minutes old. The woman up in the top part of the picture came to her aid. She used that rusty sickle in the upper left-hand portion of the picture to cut the umbilical cord. And the mother was, was really burning with fever and, and too emaciated to nurse the baby, and so the lady went and found some, some coarse table sugar at a, a little uh, shop nearby and was dabbing the table sugar on the lips of the baby. I guess in the end, you know, I tried to figure out, well, what, what did I really see here? And it's just that Bangladesh had one more mouth to feed, I think. Mothers and their infants, the railroad station. I think as you look at these pictures, I, ho I hope you'll be impressed as I was with the dignity in the, of the Bengali people. These people face really horrifying uh, circumstances, and I think with a tremendous amount of stoicism and dignity. I can think of very few of us who would be able to bear up to this with the determination that many of these people show. The government did its best, and I guess still does, to truck the most destitute off from the rail stations and other places in the, the large cities to destitute camps. Uh, my friends in the uh, relief community preferred to call them death camps, for in fact, most people went there to die. There was, there was not enough food in most of these camps to pe keep people alive. People waiting for food. You might, you might say, well, it's awfully easy to, to go to an area like Bangladesh and, and see this, and yet, uh, you could be driving down the street and, and not see any of these camps. Uh, they may be abandoned soap factories or abandoned jute mills walled off for a city block square, and behind those locked gates would be uh, two, three, four thousand people. And the look of fear on the faces of the people as they wait is to see if there'll be any food distributed that day in the camps. And the tremendous crush of bodies when the the powdered milk is about to be distributed. People bring their own bowls.
For those of you who are photographers in the audience, I included two pictures of this. This is with a telephoto lens that, to digress a minute, that compresses the perspective and I think helps tell the story about the tremendous crush of people. And this is the same scene with a wide angle lens. It doesn't give the same feeling at all. And I thought, well, you may be interested. The tools of your trade you, you use to, to help tell the story. A little boy waiting for his ration of powdered milk. I, I'm afraid that he had only several days to go. This is an abandoned soap factory in a, uh, I guess the city of Rangpur. People waiting with their ration cards. A little gal with a rusty bowl. Powdered milk. <coughs> and yet it's surprising on a half a cup of watery milk uh, that'll probably only increase the dysentery, how kids will be kids all over the world. Huh? <laughs> Amazing. This is what some of these camps looked like. <laughs> of course, it wasn't only the children who suffered greatly during the <coughs> famine, the old people as well. Uh, the lady with her ration card. I think you'd swear that the woman on the right was wearing a death mask. Right? No way of knowing how old they are. little girl suffering. It's amazing how children age greatly, decades really. And this was an abandoned baby on the streets of Dhaka. We were uh, driving along, my friends from Ames and I, and saw this little guy and sitting in a, in a gutter, apparently belonging to no one. As you talk to people in the camps, they would say that as they were about ready to leave for Dhaka and take the train, that uh, friends and relatives in their villages would come and say, please take this child. This is the healthiest of my children and the one that has the greatest chance of surviving. Please take this one with you. And so people making that journey would, would have you know, many unrelated children. And when push came to shove, uh, the kids who were, were not relatives were abandoned. In the middle of all this, there was a cholera epidemic in, in Bangladesh. And this was, photograph was taken in the cholera hospital in Dhaka. Scientists from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and the University of Texas Medical School uh, run this hospital, and they, it began as a research project. And yet, when the famine struck, so did a full-fledged cholera epidemic. And the scientists are not sure exactly if there's a causal relationship here, but certainly there's, there's some sort of a relationship in one of the things they're studying. Uh, the strategy is to keep, get these kids pumped up with fluid the first 12 or 15 hours there. They come down with the disease. And, Hopefully, if they're kept uh, full of fluids, their bodily defense mechanisms will ward off that rather visceral virus that, that causes the cholera. This is a mother in a refugee camp with her, her baby, her infant that's just died. The infant's about ready to be taken away to, to be buried. I hope during the question and answer period, somebody will ask uh, whether you think it's, it's legitimate to intrude on a, on a private moment like this. Uh, probably see what you think. I mentioned the insidious effects of malnutrition. And what you saw in Bangladesh, even in the middle of an acute food shortage, was not people dying from outright starvation as much as, as young, and young people, I mean, infants and children and old people dying from the, uh, the effects of malnutrition. This little baby has a, an ear infection, and yet, the Bengali doctor said the baby is ju was just about ready to, to succumb, something that we take for granted here in the States. And yet, in the middle of all this, there was an incredibly lush rice crop being harvested in India. I made this photograph not more than two or three city blocks from, many of the, from the 
one of the camps where I made many of the previous photographs. And I think rice is a really good looking crop. Uh, it's amazing how much food there really is there and being grown in this country, but it's not getting to the people who need it. Rice being dried in the villages. It's a Muslim society, so for the most part, women will mass themselves to, to, to men. Uh, guns and grain, huh? Shows you the, uh, I guess, the high price people put on food in an area like Bangladesh. This is a food convoy boy moving through the streets of Dhaka, and he's a member of the Raka Bahini, the <coughs> elite sort of palace guard of Sheikh Mujib Rahman, the government leader. Very ruthless sort of people. But, uh, they sort of shoot first and ask questions later, but uh, gives you the idea of the price people put on it. Of course, this is part of the problem. That, in that whole underbelly of Asia where well over, well, where most of our problems are and something like 760 million people live. Uh, animals are, are draft, they're draft animals or they're religious or social prohibitions against eating meat as a source of protein. This is the the feeding kitchen that I mentioned that I, I visited on Thanksgiving Day. The women making chapatis with flour from the United States. Mother nursing her infant as she pounded out the tortillas. And then the Chapati started to be distributed. It's raining uh, at this point. And one of the last chapatis remaining to be distributed, and yet there are many, many, many hands there. Hundreds of people <laughs> yet to be fed. And then they ran out of chapatis, and the Red Cross officials started to use clubs to, to beat back the people. And then there was no more food <coughs> for this little guy or this lady. They went hungry that day. I mentioned that food distribution is another critical part of, of our story that helped to try to tell the story of the food crisis. This is grain being moved to market in the Punjab. Once one of uh, India's uh, showcase uh, wheat growing regions. We take it for granted in the States, I guess, that, that uh, food is <coughs> moved from the farms here in Iowa to the uh, population centers uh, around the country. And yet, because the energy crisis is so intimately involved with the food crisis, uh, the shortages of fuel for modern farm implements and tractors, the shortage of fertilizer for the, to grow the miracle grains, uh, uh, these technological transfers are not very apparent. This is a guy that we can all hate. He's a middleman, a grain hoarder, uh, a wheat merchant in a market in India. His role is not unlike that of the role of the middleman here in the States. He buys from the farmers. He tries to keep as much of the wheat off the market as is possible and keep the prices high. He was unabashed, in fact, in telling us uh, uh, about his business acumen, a real fat cat. Occasionally, as these wheat sacks are being shipped through the grain markets, they break open and provide some food for this little guy who runs around the marketplace and sweeps up the, the remains. That's his daily bread. My colleague, uh, Tom Canby, the author of this article, and I went to, to Bihar, in the northeast of India, one of the most uh, distressed areas, to try to find out what people were paying for food. And the man here was paying all of his day's wages, five rupees for that little bit of corn. Oh, it went too fast. Pardon me, I, my projector skipped ahead of me. Well, we still wanted to talk about the energy crisis. Uh, in India, you know, five years ago, people were using tractors. 
and now they're back to using camels. It's no secret, I guess, that the price of oil has quadrupled in the last two years. And with it, the nations that you know, were really hoping on introducing modern agriculture have really suffered. Uh, there were tractors lined up on a farm near where I took this picture, but unable again to buy uh, fuel for the farm implements, fuel for the irrigation wells, and fertilizer for the miracle grain. In fact, uh, this is uh, irrigation, as it, as it were, in, in India. And yet, not more than 10 paces from here, there's a big tube well su uh, sunk with the money from the U.S. Agency for International Development, but now dry because people can't afford gasoline to, to run the thing. So they bail the water from the creeks up to the rice paddies. This is our, our nurse midwife. She makes her rounds through the village in, in Bihar. Attending to a baby with a skin rash, again, something that we take for granted here, but could prove fatal in a country with the very, quite primitive uh, uh, medical uh, care. And where children are really viewed as uh, instruments of, of production, not uh, you know, instruments of consumption. Uh, they need all those kids to work the farms and take care of the parents in old age, the forms of social security. And if half of them, all, if half of them die before the age of 15, you have to have a lot of pregnancies. The nurse here is listening to the fetal heartbeat of this pregnant woman. She's 24 weeks pregnant, pregnant for the 11th time. Her three surviving children are standing in the doorway. The other children have died at various stages of infancy and childhood. The nurse here advises the woman that everything seems to be well at 24 weeks. And then she puts on her other hat, pulls out her model of the female reproductive system, and explains to the woman that uh, perhaps after the, this delivery, she might have her fallopian tubes tied and uh, avoid another, pr another unwanted pregnancy. The woman was 29 years old. And then she's off uh, to the next village. This is rice. Rice being harvested in the Sacramento Valley in Northern California. When we started the story, I didn't have any idea that we grew so much rice here in the United States. But the United States accounts for 35% of all the rice in the international grain exchanges. It's being loaded on freighters here in Oakland. And I guess uh, you know where it's headed. This is Cambodia, Cambodia, Highway 4, south of Phnom Penh. The fighting's going on about half a mile to my back. They're moving up troops and tanks down the highway. And yet what you see in the foreground are rice seedlings. And they're not being planted. <laughs> because it's pretty hard to plant rice seedlings when the people are fighting over your rice paddies. Uh, Cambodia, Cambodia is an incredible country. And I, I um, you know, the whole, I, I, I'm really, you know, find it very difficult to express myself on the subject. Because in 1970, this country exported exported 330,000 tons of rice. It was a surplus country in 1970 before we helped start the Civil War there. And yet today, it's a famine country. People are starving to death everywhere. A little Cambodian boy in a market, the central market in Phnom Penh. Very little to eat. What is there goes to the military first. This Cambodia farmer, Cambodian farmer seemed pretty typical of the people I talked to. The Khmer Rouge had come to his village. They demanded rice from, from him and his uh, fellow villagers. When they didn't give it to him, they killed his caribou. They burned his house, and he and his wife fled to Phnom Penh. Part of the more than 2 million refugees who swarmed into that city that's about to fall. His wife is nursing their child in the background. He'd been in that refugee camp run by UNICEF for over a year. And I asked him, do you ever expect to go back? And he said, no. This is rice from the United States. I apologize for the small screen there. Rice from the United States. And uh, she's pretty thankful for that. Food distribution. The country is, at this point, until the other day, 99% 99, 99 dependent on food from the United States. 
Here we have rice from Louisiana brought into the pagoda. Before it's distributed, the monks in their saffron robes come out and bless it. Whatever your political feelings are about the war in Southeast Asia, and I'm sure we have many here in this room, when we talk about the human story and the human suffering, uh, all I can say is that it's, it, it's really something to be an American in that country. When I was here, I bet you in 10 minutes, 10 or 15 people came up to me and literally hugged me and said, we love America, we love America, uh, we depend on America. Uh, unfortunately, the, um, the poor, the, the innocent people seem to suffer, uh, as in all wars, I guess, because soon after, as this food was being distributed, the Khmer Rouge uh, started to rocket this refugee camp, not because there were any military targets there, but because these people were receiving their food distribution for that week. And uh, this is the last picture I made in Cambodia. Uh, they started to fire the 107 millimeter rockets in, and, and I got hurt, and the whole thing kind of fell apart. Some place where, where they're making some advances in Asia is Thailand. And this is rice, perfected, uh, the miracle rice, high yielding strains, perfected at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines and being grown in northern Thailand, a country that is making strides in both increasing its food production and limiting its population. And yet, for all the productivity that you might see in Thailand, people still fish for mudfish at the edge of the rice paddies, little bitty mudfish about a half an inch long, uh, to increase the protein in their diet. Well, if you can stay with me a couple of more minutes, we'll get into another aspect of the food crisis. One place where there's no protein deficiency is Japan. Here are the Japanese cowboys up in the mountains with their Hereford steers. And boy, these people have an appetite for beef that, that just won't quit. This is the Japanese housewife paying about $15 a pound for that, what amounts to a ribeye steak. But the people pay it. Boy, it's in a Tokyo supermarket. She's not very happy, of course, about paying $15 a pound. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean it. This is the most popular restaurant in Japan. And they're everywhere. This is the new Asian diet, in fact. An interesting side like this whole story, of course, is that the Japanese young people are getting big, and I mean big. They're not only bigger than their parents, but they're so big they don't fit in their desks at school. They don't fit in the elevators. They don't fit in their clothes. They don't fit in their beds. <laughs> they just don't fit, period. <laughs> the diet, the, in, the change in diet has dramatically increased the growth rate of the children. And I guess you only have to try to wedge yourself in a subway with a bunch of Japanese teenagers to find that out. Of course, the Japanese have been traditional fish consumers. These are eels at an eel culture farm. One of the things we wanted to talk about in our story, though, was the way in which many people, I'm sorry the top of that slide is cut off, the way in which many, many people have destroyed their ecosystems in an effort to increase food production. And with the tuna in Japan, you, you really see this, the tremendous overfishing of the coastal waters. And the tuna may be an endangered species there. Well, if we move. Uh, move on uh, briefly to uh, areas like Taiwan and the Philippines, we see the, uh, the small farmer, the guy who has one or two hectares, tremendously increasing his food production. In Taiwan, where this photograph was made, you see four crops being grown a year instead of the traditional two in Asia. And Taiwan has come from dependency to you know, not only total self-sufficiency, but a tremendous amount of agricultural <coughs> surpluses, not by using modern uh, mechanized uh, <coughs> agriculture, such as we have here in the United States, but by land redistribution, uh, some many uh, sort of capitalistic incentives, and uh, uh, you know fertilizers and the modern seeds, but applied at a very very basic level. Here's a small threshing machine in the Philippines, perfected by the International Rice Research Institute, but it's uncomplicated enough and cheap enough to help that small farmer really uh, increase his yield. Uh, interesting. Uh, note here is that if all the world's farmers used as much energy as the American farmer, we'd deplete the world's known fossil fuel reserves in 29 years. So it's, it's not going to work to introduce tractors and, and agribusiness the way we have it here in the States uh, to much of the, the world. It's, that's not the strategy. And this is one of the things we were trying to show. 
Another thing we were talking about is how do you create new land? Most of the good arable land in the, in the world is already under cultivation. And yet, you know, how do you, how do you create more land? Well, about 3,000 years ago, some folks up in the northern Luzon were uh, some pretty keen engineers, and they came up with the idea of terracing the hillside. Not a bad idea and still uh, quite relevant to the food crisis today. And these are the rice terraces in the Philippines. Down in the lower right-hand corner, if you squint real hard, you see a figure of a woman. Some pretty ingenious people 3,000 years ago. The area of northern Luzon is inhabited by hill tribe people who may, or in this case, may not be friendly. <laughs> well, one place, uh, skipping clear across the world, one place where they're trying to increase food production in the middle of the desert is Israel. And if I could tip this down, I think I ought to, in this case, see the people. Uh, they're growing carp in Israel. And boy, are they growing carp in fish ponds all over the desert. It's a tremendous source of protein. Uh, quite, quite uh, an efficient way to convert grain into a source of protein, and they lower the, when the carp are ready for market, they lower the water level, they put them in a net, and they run them up the conveyor belt off to market. And in Israel, you see a lot of good-looking food. Uh, the Israelis have taken a country that 60 years ago, I guess, very few people wanted, uh, or at least a piece of real estate, and really made it bloom. I've never seen so much good food, principally through irrigation. This was a, these are sugar beets under cultivation. The water comes from a uh, pipeline that runs from the Sea of Galilee, kind of bisects the country. 207 inch pipeline. And one place where there isn't much water, as we've talked about, is Niger, sub Sahara Africa. And here you see the effects of the drought, the Tuareg tribesmen trekking off across the desert. It had rained when we got to Niger. Many of the refugee camps were being broken up. This uh, guy was a, this Tuareg tribesman was one of the first people we talked to before we were arrested. And his story was, again, fairly typical. Six of his 10 children had died during the drought, all of his camels and most of his goats. And his future was quite bleak. Of course, the Niger River was by then quite wide. People had gone to the river, camping there, and drinking from the waters, and maybe there's a shred of optimism for things in sub-Sahara Africa. Oh, my projectors are running wild here, a voltage thing. Well, you've just seen two quick pictures of the American Midwest, and it's, you're all quite familiar with the drought that struck Iowa, Nebraska, uh, even extending as far down as, as the panhandle of Texas. Not only was the winter wheat crop uh, quite severely affected, but most severely affected was the corn crop, drastically depleting the world's food reserves. We now have about eight days of uh, food reserves in the world compared with 29 days only several years ago. And here's one of the real hunger fighters, Norman Borlaug, developer of the high-yielding strains of wheat being grown throughout much of the world, native of Iowa, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. One of Borlaug's researchers emasculating a wheat stalk, getting ready to cross it with another in the con more or less continuous effort to develop uh, high-yielding uh, varieties of wheat that are resistant to various forms of diseases and pests and so forth. At Dr. Borlaug's research institute outside of Mexico City, these young people are uh, <coughs> chemists working with the amino acid lysine to try to increase the lysine content of corn corn that's grown throughout much of uh, Mexico and Central and South America, and make it higher in protein. They've been quite successful in developing what's called opaque two corn. It's about as high in protein as a beefsteak. And it's being grown now in Colombia and Mexico and parts of the United States. Up in Canada, they're doing something else. These are embryos being extracted surgically from a pregnant cow. And uh, they'll be surgically implanted into proxy mothers so that one genetically superior cow can have maybe 15, 20 uh, offspring in a year and build up a genetically superior herd in a relatively uh, short amount of time. Aha, we lost his head. This is a British petroleum scientist in Holland, uh, just to show you his head. And uh, 
He's doing nutritional, uh, the attrition, nutritional evaluation of a thing called single cell protein food, uh, microorganisms that are grown on a base of crude oil and uh, turned out to be a pretty good both uh, animal food in this case and uh, a human food as well. Standard Oil of Chicago is an American oil company in Chicago. It's just about uh, ready to have its uh, single cell protein food be certified by the Food and Drug Administ Administration. <laughs> It'll be on the market soon. And I've had some meatloaf made with this stuff, and it tastes pretty good. Uh, in the case here in Holland, this uh, British Petroleum single cell protein stuff was being fed to that hen. And they claimed that she was fatter and healthier because she ate that stuff. And she was uh, laid better eggs as well. <coughs> of course, uh, well, my projectors are just running wild here. Something happened. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's go back here a second. Huh? I think we have a voltage problem in the room. Um, Okay, fine. Uh, we're out of sequence. This is not going to work. <laughs> Let me back. Okay. Can we have the lights? I guess. I'm sorry, our show had to end on that note. I guess these things have run wild. I guess you're going to have to talk to your audiovisual department. Well, the only thing the show ended with was some pictures. From here in the United States, uh, you might be interested. The last few slides were taken in St. Petersburg, Florida, where, not, where um, there are 25 emergency feeding centers that have been set up in St. Petersburg to feed old people, people who are the hardest hit by inflation, people trying to live on fixed incomes. And I guess maybe just, you know, I, I, I put those in to kind of uh, bring it a little bit closer to home to say that the food crisis is right here amongst us, too. There's 17 million Americans who, in one form or another, are going hungry today. And uh, I don't know. Uh, it's not maybe a very optimistic way to leave you. Uh, if you have some questions, well, I'd really be interested in entertaining them. Yes? <coughs> oh, sure. Um, in India, uh, there's a great deal of pride in, in the people. Not maybe the people who are most severely affected by food shortages and, and malnutrition or starvation or whatever, but by the government officials, uh, quite offended. And I guess you're always balancing the kind of the right of privacy of these people against what you think are, are you know, the kind of the rights of the broader society to really be informed and see what's happening. Um, not as much as you might think, OK? Uh, here in the United States, it's infinitely more difficult to take pictures of um, people on the streets of Ames, Iowa than it is uh, in downtown Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh. I've just finished this article finally at long last on the uh, Amana colonies out here near Cedar Rapids. And it's like pulling teeth to take pictures out there, you know? Uh, people are uptight. They don't like to be photographed. They, you know, feel singled out and so forth. It's much more difficult here in the States. Yes? 